you left Space Dock without a tractor beam. It's long been a plea of the sci-fi community, could scientists just go out and build a tractor beam? Even if it's only capable of bringing the TV remote towards me, I will at least feel like I'm living in the future. Well, how realizable of a goal actually is this? It turns out the light can exert a force, which is a good starting point considering ultimately we want to manipulate objects. And the force per area is something that we call radiation pressure. We see evidence of radiation pressure in the icy tails of comets as they stream away from the sun. Regardless of the direction the comet moves in, the tail always moves away because it is bombarded by a mixture of the solar wind, which are charged particles, and also this radiation pressure that emits from the sun in the form of photons. And just like using a hairdryer on an ice cube, except your hairdryer is a million kilometer across ball of burning gas and the hot air is replaced by photons. Not the best analogy. One of the reasons that we think of light as a particle rather than just a wave is that if we go to measure the intensity of a beam and we turn power down on it lower and lower and lower, rather than the intensity slowly decreasing down to zero, what we find we get is periods of no light followed by single bursts of light. This is the idea of the quantized photon, the idea that light particles arrive one at a time. Closely linked with this idea is the notion that these photons can carry properties that we usually associate with particles, being able to carry momentum and being able to transmit a force. This is a strange idea because how can particles of light that don't have any mass carry a momentum? I personally feel most comfortable understanding where this pressure actually comes from by going back and thinking about light again as a wave because we know that things with wavelengths can carry momentum. The pressure that light is able to transmit is just the force per unit area that an object feels. And the force that any sort of wave is able to carry is given by its energy flux, the amount of energy it contains per second, divided by how fast it moves, its velocity. In the case of light, our velocity is the speed of light, c. Now this way of looking at it makes a lot of sense because, well obviously the more energy you put into it, the more of a force you expect to feel from it, but also gives you a sense of why when you turn on a 100 watt light bulb compared to when you turn on a 100 watt speaker, you feel something coming from the speaker whereas you don't necessarily feel anything coming from the light bulb. I think if turning on a light bulb made you feel like you were vibrating, it would be a less popular of an experience. However, think about how good a nightclub would be. Anyway, point being that sound moves slower so can carry a bigger force. So the radiation pressure that light is able to carry means that it can give an object a push. But can it give it a pull? Hmm. Let's take a quick look at some of the work that my co-workers are doing at the moment involving manipulating objects with a beam of light. It turns out if you focus a beam of light, it sort of makes a shape similar to a Diablo, the toy, not the demonic lord of darkness. And it turns out if you focus this shape onto a particle, it does something called optical trapping. What happens is that transparent particles get stuck in this optical trap because momentum is imparted to them by the photon. Photons from high angles of the beam come in and interact with transparent particles, and as they try and pass through them, the index of refraction of the particle means that light is bent slightly. And again, as it leaves, it's slightly bent again, but the end result of these two bending events on average gives the particle some added momentum moving towards the beam. We can pull this object towards us, which means that the particle gets pulled forward into the optical trap. And it turns out that at the focus, the force of the radiation pressure pushing the particle away is equal to the force that these changes of momentum impart pulling the particle towards it. And so the particle is trapped in the focus of the beam. We can move the particle around simply by moving where we focus the beam, either moving it closer towards us or moving it further away. This is a fun technology because it means that we have a physical way of interacting with things at this sort of domain range, this size range, and the size of these particles are usually sort of millimeter on average, but it means that we can do fun things like prodding cells in the name of science or picking them up and moving them around or pinching them or pulling them apart. Any experiment that a biologist would feasibly want to physically be able to do to a cell. Here at Bristol and at Glasgow University, they naturally went one step further and they turned the whole operating system into something that could be operated by a touchscreen. So now they actually have physical tactile way of interacting with all these particles. They can trap multiple particles at once and do whatever sort of experiment one might need to be able to do with that. Most of the time they just play Pong. 
It turns out they're actually so good at manipulating these objects that they offloaded the whole thing onto an app, meaning that you can manipulate particles from the comfort of your iPhone. Other phones are available. So I think in answering the question, can we build tractor beams, I think the answer is a resounding yes. The problem, obviously, is scale. It's of limited usefulness to be able to move these tiny particles around to the everyday person. What can we do in order to scale this operation up? I have grand notions of being able to pick up a guinea pig from a distance and transport it towards me. Can science help me out? The answer, unfortunately, comes from our equation. It turns out that if you look and want to apply more force to something, the only variable you have to manipulate is how much energy you put in. And if you go to put more energy in, it turns out that you end up cooking your samples earlier than you end up pushing them around which is bad news from the guinea pig's point of view. So for now, we'll write that one off as something to try maybe on a rainy day. But like I said before, if we go back to our equation again, but instead we think about using sound, suddenly we have a lot more room to work. Sound moves at a much lower rate, so it requires much lower energies to move things around. And just for this reason, we've seen things such as acoustic levitation, the idea that you can pick up objects with sound waves and manipulate them in space. In theory, this doesn't have the same limitation because you can dump much more power in before you start doing biological harm to something through acoustic waves. So there is potential for larger scale objects to be manipulated. Whether we get up to the size of a guinea pig, I'm not quite sure yet, but it's probably what scientists are shooting for, mass guinea pig manipulation. As evidence of the fact that we can move larger objects, there is a group at Dundee University, I think, which can move something the size of a dinner plate and levitate it and keep it in position. It's not a guinea pig, but it could very well be a small family of gerbils. Now, there is one very interesting last point that I want to make, and it's the idea that this force equation, as it relates to waves, also applies to torque, the force that makes things rotate. There are some very clever theoreticians and some very nice experimentalists that are actually able to impart a twist to a beam of light just by shaping the way that the waves form. And they're able to make one of these objects that they've caught in their optical tweezers start to rotate. Now, obviously we run into the same problem of cooking things before we actually get anything of an interesting size starting to rotate. But if we go back and again, we use sound waves in place of our light waves. And if we impart that same way of spinning those sound waves by creating that helical phase offset, we can start to get more massive particles to move. And we realize we've just made a sonic screwdriver. I find it amazing the idea that you can fire a laser beam towards something and you can impart a force to it and traditionally you'd think that that force would just push it away but in fact it can start to make it spin just by the clever shaping of waves. That's the perfect amount of weirdness if you start to actually think about it. Now I have to give massive credits for this talk in general to a guy called Miles Paget from Glasgow University who basically gave this talk in a conference this weekend. But obviously he explained it much better and in much more detail with a much more rigorous mathematical background in a way that made it seem so elegant and beautiful that I hoped to attain but ultimately ended up talking about hamsters and guinea pigs. So, well, I mean, at least that's something. It was a really nice conference attended by a lot of sort of big names in my field. So from that point of view, I really enjoyed it. One of the talks actually was given by um, Philip Moriarty, the professor, one, or one of the professors from 60 Symbols, who you probably are familiar with. He gave a really, really nice talk about sort of his area of AFM and how he knows the things he knows and how he knows the things he doesn't know and how he and his field put those pieces together. More specifically dealing with whether you can actually see hydrogen bonds between atoms in his technique. My other favorite part of the conference was when some other people were mucking about with a quadcopter, one of those flying little helicopter things. And we're in this sort of like lovely regal room. <laughs> Everyone's being very like proper and then this quadcopter just appears out of nowhere, flies across the room and smashes into the wall and where it gets sort of embedded. And then up jumps a guy called Christoph Gerber, the co-inventor of the AFM, one of the most prestigious and heavily cited scientists in the world. And he scrambles up this wood paneled wall at the age of however old he is, but he's not a young man. <laughs> and he comes down with this quadcopter sort of tucked between his hands and then runs over because he wants to go. So it's a good conference overall just for entertainment value. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. Let me know what you thought in the comment section down below. Um, if you fancy subscribing, then please do. I'll leave you with just a question. 
Does all this radiation pressure silliness mean that during the day, because there is radiation pressure weighing down on you, that you weigh more? Leave your thoughts below. Anyway, I'll see you next time.